Can show us yes. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. So we've we've had two weeks of awesome material on marriage. And I'm just curious as to out of that two weeks, is there one thing that's jumped out at you and really grabbed your heart? You will be a Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what you That's what I was just about to say. There you go. That, man, I love my wife. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you preach for two and a half hours, two hours and 40 minutes, and you say all these things that are all great and relevant, but at the end of it, the end of it's supposed to bring you to the place where you realize in your heart how you actually feel about your spouse and how beautiful they actually are yeah. and how wonderful life actually is with them and how wonderful the life you've shared together actually is. Right? Yeah. Because the devil come along and he's been trying to paint a picture of your life with your spouse. He's been coming along trying to paint a picture of your spouse and trying to say, Behold your spouse. Behold your life with your spouse. Yes. And then we can kind of get caught up in living by that sometimes. And then, you know, what those messages do for me is it comes with like just this big gigantic God eraser and erases all that stuff. And says, that ain't your spouse, and that ain't your life with your spouse. And then you're able to feel, you know, what your life has actually been, apart from all the lies that try to come in. And then you, you see your spouse for as they actually are, apart from all the lies that have tried to come in through the course of you guys. Listen, running into tribulation in the world. It's like we heard Jesus say, in the world you'll have tribulation. And we, we, we hear that, and we think that just means, yeah, I'm going to have hard times. And then we discount the fact that the one we've been joined to, they're going to encounter hard times in the world. Things are going to come against their heart and their soul to try to kill them. And sometimes when those things happen, man, they're going to have a rough go of it, right? And then what happens is is we begin defining our relationships and our marriage or our spouses by that tribulation. And we don't even realize it. And then we run down the road with the wrong image of our spouse and our relationship. But if we can see what's actually happening, man, you'll actually find so much more. You'll find more love coming to your heart for your spouse than you even had at the beginning because you'll find that compassion. All those times you defined your spouse as being against you and being dissatisfied with you and angry with you and telling you all the wrong ways you're getting it and all that kind of stuff. You'll start realizing the one I love was being attacked by this world in those moments. And then you'll even feel that compassion welling up inside of you. Yeah. You know, and it just changes everything. At least it did for me. Yeah. Totally agree. And it, it takes you out of the picture as being the target of that, of your spouse's tribulation. Right? Because we oftentimes just selfishly think, oh, they're against me. And that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Yeah, we tend to process what other people are saying and doing through ourselves. Yes. Right? Yeah. And listen, if we're just being honest, sometimes our spouses can help us do that. <laughs> because they're drowning in the moment. So they don't exactly know why they're suffering. Mm-hmm. Right? And listen, if you're suffering and you don't know exactly why and there's someone else there with you, your suffering is going to tend to be geared towards them. Right? Yeah. It's inevitable. And so it's a beautiful thing to be able to step back and not process what our spouse is going through through ourselves. And then we don't take it personally. You notice how you tend to take it personally, right? And once you take it personally, whether you like it or not, you went and picked up a paintbrush and you done add a stroke to how your spouse looks in your heart. The moment you take it personal, what they've said, what they've done, what they're going through, you've gone and picked up a brush and now you've added a little, a little add-on to their image in your heart. Well, that image isn't exactly what I thought. Here, now we got it right. You know, or you went, or you went, yeah, you went, you, you had an image in your heart of this big smile glowing towards you, and then you go and change it to frown upside down and scowl and darkness, and then you begin walking around with that image in your heart. That's right, yes. And you, we don't realize, you, you're, man, you, I ran down the road with that for a long time before I realized it. Um, to the place where, I mean, where, you know, and I don't blame Becky, I'm, I'm as intense and fire as she is, but you take an Italian woman, no matter how sweet and innocent she is, who was brought up in a house of just intensity, and you take a guy intense like me, and you go stick us in a room together, and you experience, you know, the tribulation of life together, sometimes you can go at it, and not in like a quiet, uh, well, honey, do you think that we can, you know, no, I mean, it's like combustible, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, di- it's like dynamite, 
right in that thing. And, and so there were times, and I, listen, I'm sure Becky felt the same, had the same thing going, but there was times where I was, I had like the Adam man going on inside of me. It's that woman you gave me, Lord. You know, and, and just, and then, and then God just come and said, Greg, that woman I gave you is a blessing. And I, but, 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 and then let us reason together. And then he starts showing you what he sees going on. And then that changes the whole thing in your heart. Because when you see things the way God sees it, what happens is love, compassion, unity becomes born in your heart for your spouse, no matter how combustible the thing looked. Because then you see it like God, right? And I mean, listen, when if you want to look at uh, the world and Jesus, Jesus is the groom. The world would be the bride when the world was crucifying the groom. Right. When the bride was crucifying the groom, the groom saw the thing in a way that said, send this away from them for they don't know what they're doing. See, what, see, Jesus is a picture of the husband. The, the, the world of the church is a picture of the bride. He considered the weakness that was going on in the bride. Right? He didn't take it personally. He felt compassion for the weakened state of the bride. He came for her. I mean, Jesus came and basically proposed to the world, and then the world didn't just say, nah, no thanks. They crucified him. And so what Jesus didn't do was he found something dwelling in him that gave him an eyes to see something. Paul prayed that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. Right. He talked about our heart being our eyes. And so Jesus had eyes to see that his bride, the one he came to propose to, had weakness going on in them. And he didn't despise her for her weakness. He didn't despise her because of what was going on there. He found something else inside of him where he could see the darkness and the weakness that had her in bondage. And in that place, his heart and his prayer was father. Let us, let us, Father and Spirit, let us send this transgression. Let us send this darkness. Let us send this death that has weakened the ones we love. Let us send that away from them. You see? And see, what happens is, is God come to give birth to that thing in us. So we can see that in our spouses. That when we see them, even should they be freaking out and it look like it's directed at us. Because if we're being honest, sometimes it looks like it's directed at us, right? If we could see it instead of um, them being against us or them trying to hurt us, instead of taking it personal, if we could see that there is a weakness going on in them and not an imperfection like they suck, but like something is going on that's coming against them in this world, some pain, some lies, some something that is causing this to be born in them. And then we can begin talking to God like Jesus talked to God. Father, let us send this pain, this weakness that's hurting the one we love. Let us send that away from them. And then what happens is, is we commit the thing into the hands of God. We commit our spouse into the hands of God. And it's, that's, that's the dynamic of casting your care upon God because God cares for you. You can't like work it up. But the moment you see how much God cares for your life, the moment you have a care, you don't get busy thinking about how horrible the care is and how you're going to fix the care and how you can't live till the care gets fixed. All you need is for your conscience to be washed clean of the care. And when you say, Father, let us. What happens is your conscience becomes washed clean of what's happening there. You don't take it personal. You don't live with a burden. It erases whatever pain has tried to come and alter the way your spouse looks in your heart. And you're free to love and feel compassion for your spouse in that moment. And in that place, God's life can become born in you. And that can begin setting your spouse free from whatever weakness they're experiencing. Whatever suffering they're experiencing. And then unity happens in the midst of what can look like all disunity. <laughs> so, if I'm, I'm hearing you say, so, uh, Jay and I, we have lived a somewhat trajectory as far as being brainwashed by things that call themselves the Christian church. So, what we've been brainwashed for 30 years is that the Bible tells me the wife is the help meet for the husband. What that means is the wife is a tool I can use to accomplish my objective. Objective, like a screwdriver. 
So uh, the wife is my screwdriver, and the Bible tells me so. Right. As far as like a hammer. So instead of the wife having no soul, which is what we've been brainwashed for 30 years in the so-called Christian church to believe, you're advocating that there are two peers and that have empathy for each other. And I know empathy is no longer in the American vocabulary, it wasn't 30 years ago, but empathy means instead of, well, you don't think like me, so you're stupid, that's the modern way of thinking in America, empathy is there are two peers who are co-equal, living their journeys and seeking to understand the different journey this peer is. So the American church is the wife is without a soul and is strictly a tool to be used by the husband in his pursuits of whatever. Um, but you're advocating a different approach that these are, are two peers pursuing a journey uh, differently, of course, because they're, they're different individuals and have empathy for that is what I'm hearing. You're putting upside down what we've been told to be the truth for 30 years. Yeah. You're putting it totally upside down. Well, p well part of that is accurate. And I, I'm sorry, I'm particular with semantics and terminology, but I would say we're not two individuals seeking a journey. I would say we're one seeking a journey together. And actually the only way you can truly have empathy for the other one the way God was is if you saw them as flesh of your flesh, bone of your bone. Right. Who need not be assimilated and de-gutted of their, of their own feelings and humanity, but they could actually be respected, uh, co-equal with ourselves, if, potentially. Yeah, yeah. It, it's all I'm saying. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. no, I know. I just, it's just, this is on recording, and I may publish it, and so I want the terminology to be accurate for everybody here. I know what you're saying. Well, and I, and I, I don't know about the American church viewing women that way necessarily. I will say that the more legalistic your mindset is toward the things that the scriptures teach, or, or the more legalistic your religion is, whether you're a Muslim or a Buddhist or whatever, the more legalistic it is, the more you find, you see women being uh, degraded from their humanity, just like what he's saying there. So it's not really the American church. It's not, they're not to blame. It's, it's, it's a cross. It, what yeah, it's a cross I, what I'm trying to say is the, the mindset of legalism tends to that. Does that. Because clearly. In every form. Clearly, the, the more legalistic, like the Muslim church, yeah. where they really separate the woman and treat her as uh, something else. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's an excellent point. Well, yeah. I, I know very, a person who's very close to me, but she has had a, a number of people who were not Christians and hated Christians, which was the, is their prerogative, but they had the same perspective to pull out of her body whatever soul or individually individuality she had. So you're totally correct. It's not specific to a belief system or religion or lack thereof. It, it's a cross, it's poison that transcends of buckets. It certainly is. That's because the devil hates women. Mm -hmm. Yep. So he puts that belief in presents it to people to take. And, and let me throw in a point to yours, uh, Peggy, if I may. So uh, I was in this church one time, and I certainly respect the guy's sentiments, and, and you may disagree, but it's one person's feeling. So uh, a woman asked the pastor, you know, do you ever think there's anything to this idea that, that sometimes uh, maybe you know women you know, can actually have a closer like the love touch relationship sometimes than guys and, and the guy thought it's well you know I, I i've seen that at times and so love what, touch relationship with with what or who or with a with a living god with a pet, okay so with, with god with, 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 oh so with guy, anything with a rock you know with, with yeah. a plant you, you know with with, with uh, a garbage bag you know with anything more ability to to relate to to, to emote to yeah. to connect and so, Peggy, if there's any truth in that, then your idea 
that there'd be a target on women it wouldn't be as ludicrous as it sounds. You know, if there's any truth to that. Yeah. You, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a target on everybody. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, Satan doesn't just hate women. He hates all. He hates human beings. He hates human. That's what he hates. He hates human. So part of that is that he hates woman. So to tear down the man is to tear down the woman. That's, and that's why I jumped in about the two individual things. Because that's one of the problems is we see ourselves too much as individuals. In, in marriage and we see it too much as this or that to tear down the man is to tear down the woman mm. to tear down the woman is to tear down the man yeah. right and we tend to look at it as two separate and, and, and different things when they're not they're the same thing so if you go and tear down the man the woman will simultaneously be <coughs> torn down if you go and tear down the woman the man will simultaneously be torn down it's the destruction of the whole Right? It's like if you look at the Trinity, if you tear down the sun and kill the sun, the Trinity dies. Right? You can't kill one of them without the rest of it being killed. And just so everybody's not confused by that example, God can't die. Right? In the sense that he can't cease to exist. Now, God could take on a skin suit and die in that skin suit and then be raised up. Okay? But he can't die in the sense of he ceased to exist. Jesus didn't cease to exist. Right? Destruction comes through enmity between people. You're not in unity brings uh, light. Yeah. And, and you, you understand what I was saying was empathizing with your position that you're to understand where this other person is coming from and to make that effort. All I was trying to do was actually go with. No, no, I know. I just, yeah, yeah, I'm just. But it, the thing is, there aren't any women, uh, I don't think, you know, using men like chattel. In the world as, oh, it happens. You know, I've seen it, to be honest. I mean, big, like, civilizations teaching, you know, that the women are... Amazon, no, there, 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 there have Amazon been... No, there, there have been, actually. If you, look, if you look at... I mean, most people don't want to do the research to study some of Paul's writings, but some of Paul's writings about women spoke to a specific culture in the day, and they were called the new woman. So when Paul talks about the way women are adorning themselves in his letter, he's not given a blanket statement throughout all history. Okay, There was a group of women that were rising up that called themselves the new women. And their, 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 their whole view was that Eve is the one that ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so she's the wise one, not the man. Okay, so then this woman began exalting herself above the man, and then this woman began being like promiscuous. They would dress a certain way, and they would walk through town dressed that way, and that would be to declare that, yes, I'm married, but I'm out there. I'm the new, one of the new women. And so much of Paul's writings about women, not all of them, some of them were just about how does the man and the woman get along. But a lot of his writings were specifically addressing a cultural thing when he's talking about how you were born, how you look when you go out. He didn't want them to give off the appearance as if they were of that way. Okay? And so throughout history, there's always been that. In different civilizations. The reason why they're always, it's always been that, because like Marie so astutely pointed out, um, if there's legalism involved in the thinking, if there's the carnal mind involved in the thinking, it's going to give rise to that. Because the woman will begin functioning from the platform of self-justification, which is that I'm not as respected as the man. I'm not esteemed like the man. Then if you're living from self-justification and you think your value is less because you're not the man or you don't have the position of the man, you're going to rise up to try to usurp the man. That's what you're going to do. So through different periods of time in history, you have that very thing rise up. You have that very thing going on. I mean, in the, the, the pagan temples that the Corinthians worshipped in, the high priestess weren't men, they were women. They were women that were the high priestesses. And you've had that throughout. High priestesses and all that kind of stuff. And so that's one of the things. And listen, I was talking to Becky about this. You see that same mentality rising up now, right now. in the world. Yeah. And so, but listen, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? And so we'll see that thing frequently rear his head from time to time and rise up. It doesn't look the same like, like with the, what, he, what he's talking about. What do you mean? Like, he was saying, um, 
using the woman as a tool, you know. Most certainly. If the woman is going to be out there being promiscuous and she's going to flaunt it out in the town and she's going to be laying with They're whoever wants... They're usually not married, though. No, they are married. That's what the whole point was. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. In this time that Paul wrote those letters, they were married. And this is what the new woman was. That's what I'm talking about. That was a woman who was married to a man. That is using the man as a tool. It's, it goes back and forth. Visa versa. So just because we haven't seen it in our lifetime, in what we want to call quote-unquote the American church, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And, and, and Peggy, I, I think we respect where you're coming from, but to acknowledge, it, it really is true on the micro and, and macro level, these things switch uh, genders, and I'll provide a, a hasten point as far as my father. And my father and mother are, are both uh, passed on, but you know, life is life, right? And, and we all have different things that are broken in us. And really, and during those days, and you probably relate, you know, you know women weren't really uh, enabled to, to reach the high and professional level at that point. So Sandra Day O'Connor graduated law school and she got a job as a secretary. You, you, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't really in the grid, right? So my mother, basically, my, my father was, was the tool. He was the man that, that you know, she could push through dental school and, and he was the man that he could make and get off his hiney and, and go ahead and invest in real estate and become a millionaire. So while I respect your feelings, I do have to say it, it is true. It's, it's, it's swapped both ways on a micro and macro level of the, the roles, to be honest. It, it really has. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not disrespectful. It has to. <laughs> Otherwise, self just, I mean, self-justification applies to both people. I, I just think it you get wrapped around the, the axle with male and female, man and women. It's human, right? It doesn't really matter. It's the way one human being treats another human being. And to your point, as far as during the, uh, the, the brunch thing we had earlier? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Total power corrupts totally. <laughs> so any other thoughts? I, I think the example of the person drowning and the lifeguard coming to save them is just such a clear picture of what we talking about in terms of you know that person is going to struggle and do whatever they can to gain life and if they smack you or hit you or push you under wow. in your attempt to try to save them you don't impute that to them as Ooh. a personal offense upon yourself you just understand that they're trying to get life as best they can they're feeling the pressure of the water they're feeling the fact that they can't swim they're feeling the fact that life is you know, in this world is slipping through their fingers and they're going to do absolutely everything they can to get it. So as someone who comes to save that person, you have to understand that those things are going to happen and you don't paint that picture that they're a bad person because they're thrashing and smashing and doing all kinds of things. No, you understand that, it completely. That's a huge, huge example. And it is huge because what we don't realize what happens is when we impute transgression to people, it mars their image in our heart. Yes. It changes what they look like right. in our heart. And then the feelings in our heart become dictated by the image we now have of them. And so when I say impute somebody's transgression to them, it doesn't mean you say, well, that action didn't happen. It means you judge the thought and intent of their heart behind the action. You determine it to be against you. You determine it to be malicious. Mm -hmm. You determine it to be um, whatever word you want to use for it. You, you impute the thought, you judge the thoughts and intents behind somebody's heart in a, a punitive way instead of by the drowning example, yeah. which is why I use that. Yeah, because if we don't, if we judge the thoughts and intents of a person's heart behind what they've done to hurt us as a drowning person, guess what happens? The image we have of them in our heart doesn't change. We still see them as beautiful and glorious and the God kind. But if we judge the thoughts and intents of their heart behind the action as being malicious, as uh, they wanted to do this, and that, not that they were taken captive, but they sat in the corner and decided, they made a choice, da 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 if we, if, we, if we think of it that way, their image will change, and we won't see the glory. We won't see the beauty of them anymore. We won't see them as the God kind. We'll see them as the devil kind. That's why. You know, when you talk about understanding your unity with the Lord is so important because 
when, when you begin to understand that, you begin to see your wife as one with you, and you wouldn't want to treat her any different than you would want to treat yourself, because you're one with her. So why would you be harmful to someone who is one with you? Your spouse is not your enemy. No, she, she, she's not even another person. Yeah, right. She's not even another person. She, she is one with you. And if you begin to think like that, all of a sudden, who would want to be harmful to themselves? And they wouldn't. They wouldn't be harmful. And if you saw it, that's why I jumped in with the individual thing. Mm -hmm. Because a persuasion has to be born in you where you don't see it that way. Like our little dog, she, she had to get spayed. And when she got spayed, you know, they have to sew her up. And they put these stitches in her stomach. Well, she, those stitches are yelling at her and telling her things and causing her pain and causing her suffering, keeping her from being able to do what she wants to do. Now, when she sees those stitches doing all those things to her, she's not over in the corner cursing out the stitches <laughs> or despising the stitches or because she sees that as part of her. And so what she wants to do, like in a very sweet way, is she wants to just start licking it nicely. It's okay, stitches. It's okay. We'll be okay. She wants to start nurturing it and caressing it and comforting it. You see, and that's what'll happen when, when Maurice talks about where you see, Adam said, Adam didn't say, oh, I see a person separate from me that I can now use to accomplish uh, what I want for my life. Like to use Glenn's terminology, Adam said very clearly, she is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. He was making a declaration of unity, not individuality, right? And so he was making a de declaration that I see this woman as being one with me. And guys, we talked about this before, and, and you see this between Adam and Eve. Adam knew what was going to happen if he ate from that tree. He wasn't deceived. He was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam knew full and well what was going to happen. He wasn't like, well, we don't know, and let's try it. No, but Adam saw the one that was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone had eaten from the tree. He didn't possess the ability to despise her or to let her now go be off into the death by herself. That's huge. He went with her because he saw themselves as one. Now, he didn't have the right mentality or the foundation. He didn't possess the thought that I'll go with her because I know God will save me. No. I'll go with her because I know in the day that I die, God can raise me up and I won't try to clothe myself. You see, but Jesus came and thought that. See, Jesus looked at the world and he didn't despise them. He said, this is flesh of my flesh. This is bone of my bone. This is my people. Let me now come and enter their darkness. Jesus is the last Adam. Whatever you see born in Jesus, you can see a picture of in the first Adam. So Adam was consumed with grief over the fact that the one he was one with was now going to be condemned to death in darkness. Rather, let me go be with them in the darkness because we're one. You see, he didn't say, let me get rid of the, that part of me because now they're going to suffer. May I Ho hold on, I'm going to finish this point. And so then Jesus has the same thing going on in him. <laughs> he enters into our darkness. He didn't despise us because he saw man as flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. And so he entered into our darkness to be with us. But unlike the first Adam, he knew the father could save him from the death. So he joined himself into the, his bride. He joined himself into the one that was one with him or that was his because he knew the father would now raise him up out of the darkness. And in doing that, raise his bride up out of the darkness with him. Because they were one. Because they were one. Right. Yeah. You see, and so the mindset of being one, like Maurice is bringing out, is critical to where you don't despise the one you're one with when they're suffering. But you see it as if it's part of yourself. It's like if you have a splinter and it starts getting infected. Man, the last thing you want to do is get rid of your finger. You're thinking about how can I get that splinter out? What can we do to nurture it? But you're not in the back room cursing your finger and thinking, I wish I didn't have this finger. All you're thinking of about is how can we save the finger? But with our spouses, man, we're busy like, how can we get rid of the spouse? How can we get rid of this one that's bringing us all this pain and suffering? How can we get rid of them? They're the problem. Instead of being like you lately and licking the stitches in the womb and say, let's nurture them. 
flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And that's not to bring guilt or condemnation to anybody that's seeing a marriage end by divorce. Okay? So let, we're all innocent in the midst of this. But we're just going to talk about what the freaking truth is. Right? <laughs> Pardon my expletive. <laughs> with, your, with your explanation as far as the oneness, at this moment I understand a scene I saw in a movie 20 years ago. It's an Italian movie as far as it's a, it's a beautiful Italian movie. So uh, the woman marries a guy who's Jewish, and of course then they have a son. And so you know, the Nazis put uh, the father and the son on the train, and she pleads for their welfare, but it goes nowhere. And then, uh, now today, 20 years later, I understand the scene. Then she boards the train, not being Jewish, because the oneness, with you in the darkness, with you in the light, with you in living, with you in dying. All right. You see, Adam rather die himself than separate from his wife. You see? He'd rather die. He knew what the deal was going to be. And he said, I'd rather I'm going to die with her than let her go off and die by herself. You see, and what can happen is, is that type of thinking is, can be born in you from hearing it. And from fellowshipping with God. And you begin thinking like that. And then you begin viewing your spouse in a completely different light when they're suffering. Listen, man, you can't hear this and say, let me go work this principle. But it can start being born in you. And guys, it's not that the end goal is to squash the thing. Because if your mind is fixated on an end goal, you'll be working a principle. Do you see what I'm saying? And then if you don't think you see it working, you'll become frustrated and quit. So when I talk about this end goal, it's not to get you guys to think, well, let me put what Greg says to work so I can bring about the end goal. Because if that's what your mind is filled with, you're still working. Okay? But what will happen is when you start functioning from this place is that will start squashing or comforting the pain the spouse is in. That'll start killing that thing. That'll start heaping life into their death when you don't take it personally, when you consider their suffering as your suffering, instead of seeing their suffering as bringing you suffering. A completely different thing. And what happens is, is that lessens the burden or the weight of their suffering. They begin to not feel alone in the darkness, but they begin to feel like somebody is with them in the darkness. Why don't we go to support groups? Because we feel support when there's other people that are with us there in our darkness. And so when our spouse can feel like they're not alone in their darkness, but they have one with them who doesn't just understand, but has compassion for them while they're there. And that they're there with them even when they've been barking at them. (laughs) What happens is, is it brings a calmness to their drowning. It's like when you throw a life jacket or a life preserver to a person who's drowning and all of a sudden their arms are on it and they see they're not sinking anymore it brings ah hey they calm down that's what it becomes it becomes like god working in in all in each of us to throw like a life preserver to the one we love when they're suffering and then it brings a calmness to them it starts to persuade them it's going to be okay you're going to be okay this thing that's coming against you telling you you don't have life i love how you said it because that's what it is Whenever one of us is crying out, it's because one of us thinks that something is taking away from our life, right? And we're fighting for our life. That's what's going on. I don't care what you think is happening or how it looks. If your spouse is doing something that you think to be against you, it's because they think they lack life somehow. And now they're crying out to try to get it. And what happens is, is when they feel you're with them like that, that thing starts being calm. And this is why there's so many people in the grace circles that don't understand eternal life at all. And I would say most everyone doesn't really understand eternal life at all. This is why I've been hammering our death to death and eternal life. Because what happens is, is when your heart becomes persuaded that you possess a life, that nothing can add one cubit to it, or that nothing can take one cubit from it, No matter what anybody does to you, you don't have a mind thinking about how they're taking from your life. (laughs) You don't think about it from the foundation that now what's happening in them is now taking away from the life you have. 
right? But you feel as if I possess a life that nothing can take from it. How do I know? Because I saw everything in the world that could ever try to take life come against the life I have in the person of Jesus. And I watched that guy come out of the grave declaring to me, this is the life the Father has promised you. Nothing can take from it and nothing can add one cubit to it. And when you begin living like that, your heart becomes strengthened with the word of eternal life. And then you don't think of it as somebody's taking away from your happiness or your joy or your peace or your love or any of that. You don't think of it that way, even if they're attacking you. It's like if I if Superman could be standing here and I went up there and just started pounding away on Superman's stomach and I started punching Superman in the stomach. You think he's going to be upset about it? Why not? Because he knows what I'm doing can't affect his life. You see, and Jesus knew that what they were doing to him couldn't affect the life he had with the Father from the beginning. And the Father was now going to prove the life that he promised man in the beginning by letting all death and darkness come against a human being who had his life dwelling in a body. We would all, we all, guys, most of us function from the place as if death can take away from our life. But that contradicts what God said in Jesus. You see, it's a supernatural thing. That's the power of being filled by the Holy Spirit. When your heart becomes persuaded of that, that's where you find the ability born in you to love your enemy. To bless those that curse you. To pray for those who hate you. That's where you find the ability that if someone stole your coat, where you go run into the back and ask them if they need the other one. You don't find that ability by hearing somebody say, you're supposed to love your enemies. You're supposed to bless those that curse you. You're supposed to pray for those who hate you. And if you don't, then you don't have the kingdom of God. That's not how it happens. God's life has to be born in your heart. You begin thinking about your life the way God would think about his life. And so God would think, well, if somebody steals my coat, that can't take away from my life because my life is eternal. It's without beginning or end. It's incorruptible. Therefore, let me go see if I have another coat that maybe I can give them also. When you begin thinking about your life like God thinks about his life, should somebody smack you in the face because they're suffering, man, you'll turn your other cheek and say, man, do you want the other one also? You'll find yourself blessing those cursing you. You'll find yourself doing it. It won't be because you read a precept on the wall that says you're supposed to do it, and therefore I'm going to go do it, and if I don't do it, that means I don't have salvation. Or that means God doesn't love me. Or that means I don't have the kingdom of God. You guys see how that works? That's why we're hammering the message. That's why, I I don't know how many other people are doing it, but I know Bertie is. That's why we're hammering eternal life. Do you know how many negative emails we get? Just go back to preaching about love, guys. It's like, brother, do you know what gives birth to love? Yeah, that's right. And see, what's interesting is 10 years ago, Maybe even six or seven years ago, I would have despised those guys. Because I would have thought, what's wrong with them? Don't they freaking understand what the truth is? And what I realized is I would have functioned from that place because I would have thought that them being against what I was preaching could now take away from my life. That if they couldn't agree, and they wouldn't agree, and they wouldn't agree, then how can I survive? How can I live? If they think, if they don't understand what I'm saying, how can I survive? But now my heart's been so persuaded that my life isn't a life that tries to survive. My life is a life that's without beginning or end. It can't be snuffed out. So it doesn't matter if people don't agree. I can now look at them and think, what is it that's keeping them from hearing what I say? And now I can have compassion on them even when they disagree or don't like what I'm saying instead of being angry with them. So, so just to help me understand, the, the focus on the temporal life that we have here on this earth seems to be an essential part of the mind of Adam. Yeah. It's one of the primary, you could say it's, it's a principle of the mind of Adam because that cause out of that we get the sense of lack, we get the feeling of we're losing life, all of those. But when you step, step back and think about it, 
our temporal life here on this earth is like in, in eternity. I mean, it's not even a speck of eternity. But we are so wrapped up with that now. It's, it just drives everything until you come to the perspective of that's not life. Yep. That's huge. And that's called giving up the ghost. Yes, right. And God has poured out the spirit of his son who counted the life he could have in this world as nothing and gave up the ghost unto all flesh that all those that would believe on the son could find that son dwelling in them, bringing about something in them where they counted the life they could have in the earth as nothing. And so then find their life born from resurrection power instead of carnality. And that's where you start finding real life. The Adam mind is so afraid that that means not enjoying life. No, no, that's the place where you find real life. That's the place where you find your experience in a life that transcends this world, not a life that's subject to this world. And that's much of our struggle in Christianity. And it's perfect how you say that's the Adam mind that does that. James talked about in chapter 1 is how, how our lives here are like, a, a, like grass that will quickly fade away or be burned by the sun. Yet we place the utmost value on this life as if it's the end all be all. So much so that when I say it's not, people think I'm saying we're going to suffer and woe is us on this earth. <laughs> and it just reveals the mind we're thinking of. No, no. What I'm busy talking about is how you're going to have peace, love, and joy, kindness, on suffering, meekness, no matter what comes against you in this world. Because guess what? This world is this world and things are going to come against you. You can't avoid it. And the gospel ain't about how we're going to get everything worked out perfectly to where you avoid it. That ain't the gospel. The gospel is about how I'm going to give birth to a life in you that overcomes what can come against you in this world. And give you a peace, a love, a joy, a kindness, a long suffering, a meekness, a faithfulness, no matter what happens. To where even in the midst of this world coming and pointing at you and saying, look at your death. You find yourself crying out like Jesus cried out. My cup runneth over. Now imagine, this is, just a, this is just a characteristic of what this life will do inside of somebody. Jesus was dying on the cross when he said, my cup runneth over. What kind of sense does that make? <laughs> In the carnal mind, absolutely the carnal not. Mind, none. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. None. You see, in Jesus' affection wasn't set on the life he could have in the earth. That doesn't mean he didn't feel pressed in upon. He was pressed in upon in Gethsemane. That's why he sweat blood. He was looking at his blessings, not his loss. His fle- right. He was looking at the life he had. This life can't be conquered. Right. This li- I'm going to come out of the grave in three days. I know this world thinks it can conquer me. And he felt the weight. Listen, guys, there's no shame in feeling the weight of my life is being conquered. That's good. There's no shame in that. Jesus felt that, and he was God. So when we feel the weight, that doesn't mean, oh, we're getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. What that means is that this world is trying to convince us our life is being conquered. That's the moment Jesus sweat blood. But then Jesus said, Father, your will be done, not my will. And part of that was talking about the cross because the cross enters into the whole scheme. But what was happening is Jesus' flesh was crying out to him to tell him he needs to preserve his life. He's going to die. And so Jesus said, Father, your will be done, not mine. What was the Father's will? That Jesus could possess a life in a body that was born from the Spirit and could never die again. And so the Father's will was that Jesus' life would be born from the Spirit and not from the flesh. Right? And so Jesus said, Father, your will that this life I possess be born from above, be born from your kingdom, be born from your word, be born from your spirit and not the life that's in the world. Your will be done. (laughs) And then he found great salvation come. Right? Listen, when things come against me, man, and lots of things have come against me, um, I find myself going and fellowshipping with God about his life. What he's done to conquer death. What it means that I was raised up with Jesus. What it means that all death came against Jesus. I see my story in Jesus' story. And I find him interpreting my story. And the way he interprets my story all, always ends up with me. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> so it's like, you know, you, you have like a narrator or a storyteller. They're telling like a story. The serpent wants to interpret your story. 
And he wants to point to all the things in the world. And he wants to be the narrator of your story. But Jesus entered into our story so that we could behold our story in his story. And then he would become the interpreter of our, of our story. Because the way he interprets our story always ends with us saying, Touchdown! <laughs> we won the championship! That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys see that? Yes. yes. And see, that's what happened to Jesus. You see, the serpent was there interpreting Jesus' story as he hung on the cross, telling him about his life and the life he possessed. He felt the full weight of that. And then the Spirit animated his heart and his thoughts, strengthened them on the inside, and interpreted his story. Remember when we were in the beginning and it was just us and the Father and I spoke with you about this life we have? And how this life could enter into a body. And how this life could animate a body. And then that body could live forever. Remember that? Remember how the Father promised you that if you could be incarnated into human flesh and take the death of the world upon yourself and die away that death, that the Father would never leave nor forsake you, but that He'd raise you up and make you the heir of the world? Remember that conversation? Remember? You see, and then Jesus began hearing the Spirit narrate His story. Even while he hung on the cross. And in that place, he found great joy coming in the midst of all shame. <laughs> and that strengthened him to give up the ghost. To lay down the life he could have in the world. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Father, into your hands, I commit my life. And that's actually what it means to mourn. And I'll talk about that today. But Jesus mourned. It says, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Right? To mourn is to see that God does not abhor you. He hasn't forsaken you in the midst of your sin and your affliction. And you are so persuaded that he hasn't abhorred you, that he hasn't turned his back on you, that he hasn't forsaken you, that he hadn't hid his face from you in the midst of your sin and your death, that your heart cries out to him. That's what it means to mourn. And then what happens is, is you receive comfort. In that place. Blessed are those that mourn. We see that in Psalm 22. Jesus mourned. The, he talks about being surrounded by the bulls of Bashan. And they're devouring him. And they're separating his clothes. And they're offering him off. And they're pulling his beard. And he's naked. And they're killing him. And they hate him. And then he says, But he has not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one. Neither had he hid his face from him. But he heard him when he cried. He mourned. So when Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my life. He mourned. And then you see in Psalm 23, the comfort. The Lord is my shepherd, I do not lack. That's Jesus being comforted on the cross. The Lord is my shepherd, I do not lack. He leadeth me beside the still waters of grace. He teaches my heart that my life is not found in this flesh that I see dying, but my life is found in the eternal one. He maketh me to lie down and go to rest, even in this place where I see death. He prepareth a table for me in the midst of this death. A table of what? A table of life. He comes and feeds my soul with the fatness of his incorruptible life in the midst of me seeing this death. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. My cup runneth over. Blessed are those that mourn. And so, man, listen, God knows what it's like to walk through the tribulations. He came and did it, and he felt it. He says he couldn't be a high priest unless he felt the same thing you felt. The devil wants to convince you there's something wrong with you for what's happening to you and what you feel. And God wants to tell you, I know, man, I know. I felt that, too. I walked through that. I know, man. It's okay. And then what happens is, is you find your heart cry out to God in that place. You mourn. (laughs) Talk about, you know, God entering into our history. You know, Psalm 22 and 23, you know, both speak in the crucifixion and the glories that would follow. But uh, David wrote those psalms. And when he wrote those psalms, he was writing about himself. He was being persecuted by Saul 
and he felt that persecution, all these things coming against him. And somehow or another, because of the relationship that he had with the Lord, God used his crying out and the affliction that he was feeling by Saul, and he wrote those words. Now, when was, uh, you know, David's feet and hands pierced? Well, they weren't literally pierced, but he felt that piercing coming from Saul. And he was writing these things about himself. But God entered into that to reveal that he was entering into his history and would ultimately redeem him from that affliction. You see, you know. Amen. That's you? beautiful. And, yeah. and man, it, to, to think, and, and guess what? As you read these words from these Psalms, you are thinking to yourself, that's me in there, too. Absolutely. Yep. You know what I mean? That, that's exactly right. And guys, what he's saying is we tend to read the Psalms as if it's talking about somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's talking about us, man. Yes. Absolutely. All of our story is the same story. That's right. It's talking about us. And when you just read it from like a third person, listen, you could find some wisdom there and you can like it. But when you start reading it from the first person, mm -hmm. the power of what's being spoken there is born in you. And... What, what he just said is, is a, David is a classic example of blessed are they that mourn. Mm, that's right. So when the Beatitude says, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you go read the Psalms, the, the first half of almost every Psalm is about, Lord, what's <laughs> happening? <laughs> and then, but you see towards the middle, he starts being comforted. And by the end of it, you see him as saying, but I will, I will be victorious, right? right? Yeah. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Right? That's a great example of that. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing. And so, guys, God doesn't despise you if you're in that place. If you're in that darkness. He understands. He understands this world is surrounding you with darkness. And he wants you to know he's there with you in that place. He wants you to be honest about your heart. He wants you to talk to him about every doubt, every fear, every concern, everything you think. He doesn't want you to feel any shame about it, even if you're angry, if you're frustrated, if you're confused. He knows. He was there. He felt that. That's why it says we have a compassionate high priest who was touched if every bit of our infirmity, yet he didn't sin. He never doubted in the midst of partaking of every infirmity we partake of. See, what happens is, is we tend to doubt in the midst of the infirmity. We feel separated from life. And if we feel separated from life, we know in God there's only life and there is no darkness. And then we feel separated from God. And if we're separated from God, that must mean he forsook us. He must have forsaken me in this place. Then you become not mourning. Because mourning isn't just to be sad. Pharaoh mourned. Or Pharaoh was sad. He didn't mourn. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He, uh, Esau was sad. He didn't mourn. Yesterday we had a, a dinner party.